chapter twenty one of the mystery of the downs by john watson and arthur j rees this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva chapter twenty one detective gillette cycled across to ashlingsea the following morning after spending the night in staveley as the guest of inspector murchison the morning was clear the downs were fresh and green beneath a blue sky and the sea lapped gently at the foot of the cliffs in the bay the white sails of several small boats stood out against the misty horizon but detective gillette saw none of these things his mind was too busily engaged in turning over the latest aspects of the cliff farm case to be susceptible to the influences of nature he reached ashlingsea after an hour's ride and decided to call on miss maynard before going to the police station the old stone house and its grounds lay still and clear in the morning sun the carriage gates were open and gillette cycled up the winding gravel drive the house looked silent and deserted but the shutters which protected the front windows were unclosed and a large white peacock strutting on the lawn in front of the house uttered harsh cries at the sight of the man on a bicycle the bird's cries brought a rosy-cheeked maid-servant to the front door who stared curiously at gillette as he jumped off his bicycle and approached her a request for miss maynard brought a doubtful shake of the head from the girl so gillette produced his card and asked her to take it to her mistress the girl took the card and shortly returned with the announcement that mrs maynard would see him she ushered him into a large handsomely furnished room and left him a few minutes afterwards gillette heard the sound of tapping in the hall outside the door then the door was opened by the maid who had admitted gillette and he saw an elderly lady with refined features and gray hair looking at him with haughty dark eyes she was leaning on an ebony stick and as she advanced into the room the detective saw that she was lame i wanted to see miss maynard said gillette making the best bow of which he was capable you cannot see my daughter she uttered the words in such a manner as to give gillette the impression that she was speaking to somebody some distance away why not she is not at home where is she that i cannot tell you when will she return i do not know but madam i must know replied gillette your daughter has placed herself in a very serious position by the statement she has made to the police concerning the cliff farm murder and it is important that i should see her at once where is she i decline to tell you you are behaving very foolishly madam in taking this course surely you do not think she can evade me by hiding from me if that is her attitude i will deal with it by taking out a warrant for her arrest i must decline to discuss the matter any further with you mrs maynard moved towards the bell as she spoke as though she would ring for a servant to show the detective out of the house gillette seeing that further argument was useless did not wait for the servant to be summoned but left the room without another word he rode down to the ashlingsea police station with an uneasy feeling that his plans for the capture of brett were not destined to work out as smoothly as he had hoped it had seemed to him a simple matter then to see miss maynard in the morning frighten the truth out of her ascertain from her where her lover was hiding and have him arrested as quickly as the telegraph wires could apprise the police in the particular locality he had chosen for his retreat but he had overlooked the possibility of the hitch he had just encountered obviously the girl in finding that marsland had not been arrested had begun to think that her plans had miscarried and had therefore decided to evade making any further statement to the police as long as she could gillette was hopeful that sergeant westaway with his local knowledge would be able to tell him where she was likely to seek seclusion in order to escape being questioned he had not conceived the possibility of miss maynard having taken fright and disappeared from the town because he deemed it impossible that she could have known 
that he was aware how she had tried to hoodwink the police yet that was the news that sergeant westaway conveyed to him when he mentioned the young lady's name she left ashlingsea by the last train from here last night the nine thirty to staveley which connects with the last train to london what exclaimed the detective do you mean to tell me you've let the girl slip out of your hands why the blazes didn't you stop her from going how was i to stop her replied the sergeant in resentment at the imperative tone in which the detective spoke i didn't get home from staveley last night until nearly ten o'clock and after looking in here i went straight to bed the station-master told me about an hour ago that she had gone she came along just before the train started and he put her in the carriage himself he thought it a bit strange so he mentioned it to me when i was down on the station this morning i rang up inspector murchison in order to let it you know but he told me you'd left for here she's gone to warn brett she's in london by now said gillette the question is how did she get to know that i was coming over to see her this morning and expose the tissue of lies in her statement to you how did she get to know that the game was up you've said nothing to anybody westaway about the conversation that took place last night at sir george granville's house of course i've said nothing replied sergeant westaway she had gone almost before i got back here last night it beats me said gillette who could have warned her he picked up the telephone book off the office table and turned its leaves hurriedly when he had found the number he wanted he took up the telephone and spoke into the receiver double one eight staveley and be quick is that sir george granville's is mr crewe in yes at once please is that you mr crewe it's gillette speaking the girl has gone cleared out i cannot say i've no idea what's that you say oh yes i'll telephone to scotland yard and tell them to keep a lookout for her but i'm afraid it won't be of much use she's had too long a start but it's now more necessary than ever that we should act quickly if we hope to lay our hands on the man i think the first thing to be done is to make a thorough search of the cliff road for the actual spot where the job was done oh you have by jove that's good i'd be glad if you'd come with me then because it's on your theory that it was done away from the house that i'm working police constable heather entered the office at this point with a message for his superior officer sergeant westaway divided by anxiety to hear the telephone conversation and a determination that his subordinate should not hear it imperiously motioned constable heather away but as constable heather misunderstood the motion and showed no inclination to depart sergeant westaway hurriedly led him out of the office into the front garden heard what he had to say and dismissed him with a mandate that he was on no account to be interrupted again he then returned to the office but the telephone conversation was finished and detective gillette was seated in the sergeant's office chair looking over a document which sergeant westaway recognized as miss maynard's statement crewe is going to drive us along the cliff road this afternoon to see if we can locate the spot where lumsden was shot said the detective restoring miss maynard's statement to his pocket-book and looking up i've arranged to meet him the other side of the cutting at the top of the farm and we will drive back along the road in his car did mr crewe express any opinion as to who who had warned miss maynard to take to flight asked sergeant westaway eagerly that was not a matter for discussion through the telephone responded gillette curtly i'll talk it over with him this afternoon i'll call for you here at two o'clock i've several things to do in the meantime they met again at the appointed hour and cycled along as far as cliff farm where they put up their bicycles then they walked up the hill from the farm at the end of the cutting they saw crewe's big white car stationary and crewe and marsland standing on the greensward smoking cigars the two police officers advanced to meet them 
it's a bit of very bad luck about this girl disappearing mr crewe said gillett what do you make of it westaway thinks she may have gone to stay with friends at staveley and that her departure at this juncture is merely a coincidence miss maynard would not pay a visit to friends by the last train at night said crewe then somebody warned her that the game was up and that safety lay in flight i'm afraid that's the only reasonable explanation for her disappearance replied crewe but who warned her that's the point exclaimed gillette i have been thinking it over ever since i discovered she had gone and i've come to the conclusion that it must have been that infernal little dwarf or her husband though what is their object is by no means clear who else could it have been the only other people who know that i intended to unmask her are yourself westaway and mr marsland by a process of elimination suspicion points to the granges crewe did not reply while gillette was speaking a flash of that inspiration which occasionally came to him when he was groping in the dark for light revealed to him the key by which the jigsaw of clues incidents hints suspicions and evidence in the cliff farm murder could be pieced together but the problem was one of extraordinary intricacy and he needed time to see if all the pieces would fit into the pattern it was at detective gillette's suggestion that they walked up to the top of the hill to the headland where marsland's horse had taken fright on the night of the storm he took crewe's arm and walked ahead with him leaving the sergeant to follow with marsland as they went along he unconsciously revealed the extent of his dependence on crewe's stronger intelligence by laying before him the remaining difficulties regarding the case his chief concern was lest miss maynard should warn brett in time to enable him to slip through the net which had been woven for him to crewe's inquiry whether the london police had come across any trace of him he shook his head no he is lying low wherever he is my own belief is that he has not gone to london but that he is hidden somewhere in the staveley district i shall look for him here and scotland yard is watching his london haunts he's a pretty bad egg you know we've a record of him at scotland yard what has he done he's identical with a fashionable rogue and swindler who under the name of delancey kept a night-club and a gambling hell in piccadilly during the first year of the war we had reasons for closing the place without a prosecution and delancey instead of being sent to jail was allowed to enlist he returned to england a few months ago invalided out of the army where he was known under the name of powell since then he has been employed by the government in secret service work mixing with the germans who are still at large in this country and getting information about german spies he was given this work to do because he speaks german so fluently that he can pass as a german amongst germans i suppose this girl maynard will try to join him wherever he is resumed gillette after a pause it's a queer thing don't you think for a well-brought-up english girl of good family to make such a fool of herself over an unmitigated scoundrel like delancey or brett or powell or whatever he calls himself from what i have learnt up at staveley this girl first met brett about three months ago i do not know how they came to know each other but from her visit to cliff farm on the night of the murder i think that lumsden must have introduced them there was some bond between brett and lumsden which i have been unable to fathom it is true they knew each other through being in the army together but that fact doesn't account for their continued association afterwards because there was nothing in common between the two men brett was a double-dyed scoundrel and lumsden was a simple quiet sort of chap it may have been the attraction of opposites or it is more likely that lumsden knew nothing about brett's past continued gillette brett was certainly not likely to reveal it 
more especially after he met the girl because then he would keep up his friendship with lumsden in order to have opportunities of meeting her at cliff farm she also used to visit brett at staveley they've been seen together there several times apparently it was brett's idea to keep his meetings with this girl as secret as possible and for that reason he used to see her at cliff farm with lumsden's connivance nevertheless he was not altogether successful in keeping his love affair dark on two occasions he was seen walking with the girl on ashlingsea downs not far from her mother's house and there's been some local gossip in consequence you know what these small country places are for gossip you've put this part of the case together very well said crewe oh it's not so bad gillette laughed complacently of course it was scotland yard that fished up all that about brett's antecedents i flatter myself that we do that kind of thing better in london than anywhere it's difficult for a man to get rid of a shady past in england however i'd be more satisfied with my work if i had brett under lock and key what a fool i was not to go straight across to that girl's house last night after i saw you instead of waiting till the morning it wouldn't have made much difference i think she was warned by telephone and probably the person who warned her knew you did not intend to look her up until the morning if you had altered your plans she would have altered hers i could have telephoned to have her stopped at victoria or london bridge not much use responded crewe with a shake of the head she wouldn't have revealed brett's hiding place i'd have kept her under lock and key to prevent her warning him said gillette viciously quite useless her detention would have been notified in the press brett would have taken warning and disappeared by the way gillette i'll be glad if you will refrain from referring to the doubt i formerly expressed about brett's guilt and i must ask westaway to do the same i thought you'd come around to my way of thinking said gillette it was plain to me that it couldn't be anyone but brett however you can rest assured i won't try to rub it in we all make mistakes at this game but some don't care to acknowledge a mistake as candidly as you have done mr crewe the cliffs rose to a height of three hundred feet at this part of the road and a piece of headland jutted out a hundred yards or so into the sea a narrow strip of crumbling sandstone rock running almost to a point with sea-worn sides dropping perpendicularly to the deep water below just past the headland on the stably side the road ran along the edge of the cliffs for some distance the side nearest to the sea being protected by a low fence and flanked by danger notices at each end crewe pointed out the danger post which had been knocked out of the perpendicular it was the one nearest the headland detective gillette examined it very closely and when marsland and the sergeant joined them he asked marsland if he could point out to him the exact spot where his horse had taken fright on the night of the storm i think it was somewhere about here crewe it was about here we saw the hoof marks wasn't it crewe measured the distance with a rule he had brought with him from the motor car a trifle more to this way about here he said at length gillette glanced over the edge of the cliff and at the white water breaking over the jagged tooth-pointed rocks nearly three hundred feet below by jove you can congratulate yourself that you happen to be on the right side of the road he said addressing himself to marsland if you'd gone over there you wouldn't have stood much chance it was pretty good fortune or my horse's instinct laughed marsland the road was so dark that i didn't know where i was myself i couldn't see a hand's turn in front of me the marks of the car wheels ran off the road at this point bumped into the post and then ran on to the road again crewe traced the course with his stick brett had a narrower escape than marsland 
it's a wonder that the impact didn't knock away that crazy bit of fencing when brett is on his trial it will be necessary for the jury to visit this spot said sergeant westaway solemnly we've got to catch the beggar first grumbled gillette but let's get along and see if we can hit upon the spot where the murder was actually committed how far along is it mr crewe to where the countryman you talked to saw him pass a little more than five miles from here then somewhere between the two places the murder must have been committed i should say i know the place approximately replied crewe i've been over the ground several times and i've been able to fix on it more or less definitely how did you fix it asked gillette curiously i had several clues to help me replied crewe in a non-committal voice let us get back to the car and i will drive you to the place they walked back to the car and drove slowly along the winding cliff road about two miles from the danger post the road turned slightly inland and ran for a quarter of a mile or more about two hundred yards distant from the edge of the cliff at this point the downs began to rise above the level of the road and continued to do so until they were above the heads of the party in the car it was not a cutting merely a steep natural inclination of the land and the road skirted the foot of it for some distance a ragged fringe of beech trees grew along the top of the bank doubtless they had been planted in this bare exposed position of the downs to act as a wind-screen for the sheep which could be seen grazing higher up the slope crewe pulled up the car and looked about him then turned his head and spoke to gillette this part of the road is worth examining there are several features about it which fit in with my conception of the scene of the crime the four men got out of the car and walked forward looking about them crewe walked a little ahead with his eyes roving over the rising bank and the trees at the top several times he tried to clamber up the bank but the incline was too steep what are you trying to do said gillette who was watching his proceedings curiously i am trying to fit my theory of the crime by actual experiments if i can satisfy myself that lumsden was able to climb this bank at some point i believe we shall have reached the scene of the murder but why is it necessary to prove that asked gillette in a puzzled voice brett might have met him on the road shot him from the car which had been pulled up and then carried the body to cliff farm my dear gillette have you forgotten that the bullet which killed lumsden took an upward course after entering the body if he had been shot from the car it would have gone downwards damn it i forgot all about that point exclaimed gillette reddening with vexation lumsden couldn't have been shot on the road either because in that case the bullet would have gone straight through him unless the man who fired the shot knelt down in the road and fired upwards at him which is not at all likely furthermore lumsden was shot in the back low down and the bullet travelled upwards and came out above the heart therefore we've got to try and visualize a scene which fits in with these circumstances that's why i have been looking at this bank so carefully let us suppose that lumsden was walking along the road and encountered his would-be slayer lumsden saw the revolver and turned to run he thought his best chance of escape was across the downs so he dashed towards the bank and sprang up it he had almost reached the top when the shot was fired that seems to me the most possible way of accounting for the upward course of the bullet i see said gillette nodding his head brett might have fired from his seat in his car in that case precisely returned crewe but the weak point in my argument is that so far we have not reached a point in the bank which is capable of being scaled a little further along it narrows and is less steep said marsland who had been listening intently to crewe's remarks come i will show you he led the way round the next bend of the road and pointed out a spot where the branches of the trees which formed the wind-screen hung down over the slope 
which was much less steep it was a comparatively easy matter to scramble up the bank at this point and pull oneself up on to the downs by the aid of the overhanging branches crewe made the experiment and reached the top without difficulty so did gillette marsland and sergeant westaway remained standing in the road below watching the proceedings the downs from the top of the bank swept gradually upwards to the highest point of that part of the coast a landmark known as the giant's knoll a lofty hill surrounded by a ring of dark fir trees which gave the bald summit the appearance of a monk's tonsure this hill commanded an extensive view of the channel and the surrounding countryside on a clear day but detective gillette was not interested in the giant's knoll he was busily engaged examining the brushwood and dwarf trees forming the wind-screen at the point where they had scrambled up suddenly he turned and beckoned to crewe with an air of some excitement look here he said as crewe approached this seems to bear out your theory he pointed to the branch of a stunted beech tree which had been torn away from the parent trunk but still hung to it withered and lifeless attached by a strip of bark if brett shot lumsden as he was scrambling up the bank lumsden might easily have torn this branch off in his dying struggle the instinct to clutch at something as he fell back into the road it's possible but it's not a very convincing clue by itself returned crewe it might just as easily have been torn off by the violence of the storm the thing is to follow it up if lumsden was shot at this point the bullet which went through him may have lodged in one of the trees gillette had begun to search among the scattered trees at the top of the bank very much like an intelligent pointer hunting for game he examined each tree closely from the bowl upwards suddenly he gave a shout of triumph look here crew he had come to a standstill at a tree which stood a few yards on the downs away from the wind-screen a small stunted oak with low and twisted branches fair in the centre of its gnarled trunk was a small hole which gillette was hacking at with a small penknife as crewe reached his side he triumphantly extracted a bullet which had been partly flattened by contact with the tree by jove he exclaimed what a piece of luck what a piece of luck he held the bullet in the palm of his left hand turning it over and over with the penknife which he held in his right he was so absorbed in his discovery that he did not notice crewe stoop and pick up some small object which lay in the grass a few yards from the tree end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the mystery of the downs by john watson and arthur j rees this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva chapter twenty two crewe and marsland sat at a table in sir george granville's library with the cryptogram before them the detective was absorbed in examining it through a magnifying glass but marsland kept glancing from the paper to his companion's face as though he expected to see there some indication of an immediate solution finally he remarked in a tone which suggested he was unable to control his impatience any longer well what do you make of it not very much as yet replied crewe putting down the magnifying glass but there are one or two points of interest in the first place the paper has been cut with a pair of scissors from the fly-leaf or title page of an old book an expensive book of its period of the late fifties i should say but the writing is of much later date these facts are obvious and do not help us much towards a solution of the contents they may be obvious to you but they are not so obvious to me said marsland taking the paper into his hands and looking at it thoughtfully i suppose you judge the sheet to have been taken from an old book because it is yellow with age but why an expensive one of the fifties and how do you know it was cut out with a pair of scissors again 
how do you know the writing is of a much later date than the book the ink is completely faded the smooth yellow and glossy surface of the blank side of the paper indicates conclusively that it is the title page or flyleaf of a good class book of the fifties you will not find that peculiar yellow color which is not the effect of age and velvety feel in books of a much later date the unevenness of the cut proves that the sheet was taken from the book with a pair of scissors haven't you ever noticed that nobody except perhaps a paper hanger can cut straight with a pair of scissors if it had been cut with a knife it might have slanted a little but it would have been straighter a knife cut is always straighter than the wavering cut of a pair of scissors directed by the eye the faded ink proves nothing inferior ink such as is sold in small village shops from where the ink at cliff farm was probably procured will fade in a few days it is only the best ink that retains its original color for any length of time but the character of this writing indicates to me that it was written with a particular kind of fine nib which was not invented till after nineteen hundred can you make anything of the figures and letters on the paper asked marsland that is where our difficulties commence we have to ascertain the connection between the figures and the letters and the circle to find out whether the former explain the latter or whether the circle explains the figures and the letters if the figures and the letters are a cryptogram we ought to be able to find the solution without much difficulty the circle however is a remarkable device and it is difficult to fathom its meaning without something to guide us i thought at first it might have been capable of some masonic interpretation but now i doubt it the most likely assumption is that the circle and the lines in some way indicate the hiding place of the money by geometry suggested marsland closely examining the circle on the paper i think not it is hardly likely that the old farmer who concealed the treasure would be versed in the science of geometry he may have drawn the circle to indicate a certain place where he had concealed the money and added the two lines to indicate the radius or point where it was to be found local gossip declares that the old man hid his money somewhere in the landing-place or old boat-house where it is covered at high tide and that his ghost watches over it at low tide to prevent anybody stealing it there are stories of treasure seekers having been chased along the sands almost to ashlingsea by the old man's ghost the villagers give the landing place and that part of the coast road a wide berth at night in consequence i do not think the old man hid his money in the boat-house or landing place said crewe he would have known that the action of weather and tide would make such a hiding-place unsafe he would look for a safer place he has almost certainly hidden it somewhere about the farm and the circle and the letters and figures will tell us where when we discover their meaning crewe opened his notebook and commenced to make some calculations in figures marsland meantime occupied himself by looking at the circle through the magnifying glass and in counting the figures in its circumference perhaps these marks in the circle represent paces he said struck by a new thought suppose for instance that the old man measured off a piece of ground with a tape measure fastened to some point which would represent the pivot or centre of his circle he may have fastened the end of his tape measure to the well pump in the brickyard and walked round in a circle holding the other end in his hand sticking in pegs as he walked the top figure inside the circle one hundred fifty may mean that the circle is one hundred fifty yards in circumference within the radius of the circle he buries his money makes a drawing of the circle of figures and the remaining figures to indicate its whereabouts 
and then removes the cord and pegs ingenious but unlikely commented crewe for one thing such a plan would need compass points to enable the searchers to take their bearings north or south may be indicated in the cryptogram when we discover it said marsland no no said crewe shaking his head your idea is based on treasure hunt charts and novels my experience is that in real life people do not go to much trouble in hiding money or valuables they put them away in some chance place or odd receptacle which happens to appeal to them and where i think they really have a better chance of remaining undiscovered for years than in a more elaborately contrived hiding place in the farndon missing will case involving one of the largest estates in england the will was found after the lapse of ten years concealed in the back of a book where the deceased lord farndon had placed it in his latter days when he imagined himself surrounded by thieves if you open a large book about the middle it discloses an aperture at the back sufficiently large to conceal a paper and when the book is closed there will be no sign lord farndon concealed his will in one of the estate ledgers which was in constant use for some time after his death and yet the will would probably have never been discovered if a mouse had not eaten through the leather back long afterwards disclosing the hidden parchment in the case of the stolen trimarden diamond the thief a servant in the house escaped detection by hiding the jewel in a common wooden matchbox in a candlestick in his bedroom the police searched his room but never thought of looking into the matchbox and he got away with the diamond if he had not bragged of the trick in a tavern he would never have been caught as regards hidden money people of miserly proclivities who are frightened to put their money into banks prefer a hiding-place under cover to one in the open a hiding-place in the house seems safer to them and moreover it enables them to look at their money whenever they feel inclined i knew one miser who used to hide sovereigns in a bar of yellow soap thrusting them in till they were hidden from view the treasure of cliff farm is hidden somewhere in the farm and the circle and the cryptogram are the keys the explanation is hidden in the cryptogram and i have no doubt that there is a very simple explanation of the circle when we discover the cryptogram i remember as a boy at school that we used to have endless fun solving cryptograms which appeared in a boy's magazine said marsland figures were substituted for letters and the interpretation of the cryptogram depended largely on hitting on the book from which the figures had been taken the system was to put down the number of the page then the number of the line then the number of letters in the line which would form a word the key book happened to be a bound volume of the magazine in question i guessed that and won a prize another form of cryptogram for competition in the same journal was a transposition of the letters of the alphabet but that was easily guessed from the repeated occurrences of certain letters used to represent the vowels i remember those boyish devices said crewe with a smile but true cryptography is more scientifically based than that systems of secret writing are practically unlimited in number and variety and so are solutions human nature hates being baffled and the human brain has performed some really wonderful achievements at the expense of much effort and patience in solving systems of cryptography which the inventors deem to be insoluble i have a weakness for cryptograms myself and at one time collected quite a small library on secret writing from the earlier works by bacon and trimetheus to 
the more modern works by german cryptographists who have devised some remarkably complicated systems which no doubt were largely used by the germans before and during the war for secret service work it is astonishing the number of books which have been written on the subject by men who believed they had discovered insoluble systems of secret writing and by men who have set out to prove that no system of secret writing is insoluble even the ancient hebraic prophets used cryptography at times to veil their attacks on the wicked kings of israel how long do cryptograms the more scientific i mean usually take to solve some cryptograms can be solved in an hour others may take months do you think that this one will prove very difficult asked marsland pointing to the cliff farm plan as he spoke i cannot say until i have studied it more closely the solution of any cryptogram depends first on whether you have any knowledge of the particular system used and then on finding the key it is quite possible and frequently happens that one is able to reconstruct the particular system of secret writing from which a cryptogram has been constructed and then <laughs> fail to find the key a really scientific cryptogram never leaves the key to guesswork but gives a carefully hidden clue for the finder to work upon because most cryptograms are intended to be solved and if the composer of the message left its discovery to guesswork he would be defeating his own ends this particular cryptogram looks to me to be scientifically constructed i cannot say yet whether it is possible to reconstruct it and solve it crewe resumed his scrutiny of the plan making occasional entries in his notebook as he did so marsland leaned back in an easy chair lit a cigar and watched him in silence the detective's remark convinced him that there was a wide difference between serious cryptography and the puzzle diversions of his schoolboy days and he felt that he would be more of a hindrance than a help if he attempted to assist crewe in his task of unravelling the secret of the hidden wealth whose hiding-place had been indicated by its deceased owner in the symbols and hieroglyphics on the faded sheet of paper he reclined comfortably in his chair watching languidly through half-closed eyes and a mist of cigar smoke the detective's intellectual face bent over the plan in intense concentration after a while crewe's face seemed to grow shadowy and indistinct and finally it disappeared behind the tobacco smoke marsland had fallen fast asleep in his chair he was awakened by a hand on his shoulder and struggled back to consciousness to find crewe standing beside him his dark eyes smiling down at him i am afraid i fell into a doze marsland murmured apologetically as the room and its surroundings came back to him you've been sleeping soundly for nearly two hours said crewe with a smile impossible exclaimed marsland he took out his watch and looked at it in astonishment by jove it's actually six o'clock why didn't you wake me what for i became so absorbed in the old man's secret that i had no idea of the flight of time till i looked at my watch a few minutes ago he has evolved a very neat cryptogram very neat and workmanlike it was quite a pleasure to try and decipher it have you found out anything about it i believe i have solved it and what is the solution asked marsland now thoroughly awake where is the money hidden now you are going too fast said crewe i said i believed i have solved the secret in other words i believe i have hit on the old man's cryptogram and the key which solves it but i have deferred applying the key till i awakened you as i thought you would like to share in it End of chapter twenty two
chapter twenty three of the mystery of the downs by john watson and arthur j rees this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva chapter twenty three crewe went to the table and picked up the plan my first impression was that the circle of figures represented some form of letters of the alphabet arranged on what is called the cardboard or trellis cipher in which a message is concealed by altering the places of the letters without changing their powers such messages are generally written after the chinese fashion upwards and downwards but there is no reason why a circle should not be used to conceal the message in this case i did not expect to find a message hidden in the circle but rather the key to the solution of the letters above the circle which i was convinced formed the real cryptogram the recurring t's and m's in the top line seemed to indicate that it was some form of changed letter cipher complicated by having to be read in connection with the figures in the circle which represented other letters of the alphabet the numbers representing an ascending series from six to eighty-nine with one recurring six suggested the possibility of this form of cryptogram having been used the numbers in the centre suggested a sum which when done would throw some light on the arithmetical puzzle in the centre of the circle by division subtraction or multiplication i worked for a solution on these lines for some time but ultimately came to the conclusion that the solution did not lie within them i am not an arithmetician but my calculations told me enough to make me realize that i was on the wrong track i next attempted to ascertain if the two mysterious messages the lines on the top and the circle of figures were two separate messages read independently of one another i did not think they were but i determined to put it to the test obviously if they were the top line was merely a changed letter cipher and nothing more these are usually easy to decipher because of the frequency with which certain letters recur in english the letter that occurs oftenest is e then t then a o n i then r s h the others in lessening frequency down to j and z which are the least used letters in the english alphabet the recurring letters in our cryptogram are t's and m's using these as a basis to give me the key i tried all likely combinations on the changed letter basis but without success i came back to my original idea that the figures in the circle were the solvent of the line of letters above and concentrated my efforts in attempting to discover their meaning i finally came to the conclusion that the figures represented the pages or lines of some book like the cryptograms i used to solve when i was at school suggested marsland with a smile rather more difficult than that in that form of cryptogram rows of figures are turned into words once you hit on the right book this cryptogram is much more ingenious for it consists of three parts a line of meaningless letters and a circle of equally meaningless figures with other figures within it and some plain english verses of scripture the whole probably interdependent if the circle of the figures represented some book necessary to the solution of the whole cryptogram the first thing to find out was the book from which the figures had been taken i had not much difficulty in arriving at the conclusion that this book was a large brass-bound family bible i saw at cliff farm i suppose the texts on the bottom of the sheet suggested that idea to you said marsland crewe shook his head i've learnt to mistrust guesswork he said it would be a jump at uh, random 
to come to the conclusion that the cryptogram had been drawn on the fly-leaf of a bible because it contained some scripture texts there is no connection between the facts in fact it seemed unlikely to me at first that a religious man like the old farmer would have mutilated his family bible for such a purpose i was inclined to the view that he had taken a fly-leaf from one of his leisure hour bound volumes which at the farm range from eighteen sixty to the early seventies a period of years when this kind of glossy thick paper was much used for fly-leaves by english printers but while i was examining the sheet through the magnifying glass i detected this mark on the edge which proved conclusively to me that the cryptogram had been drawn on the fly-leaf of the family bible have a look at it through the glass you cannot detect it with the naked eye crewe held the sheet edgeways as he spoke and pointed to one of the outer corners marsland gazed intently through the glass and was able to detect a minute glittering spot not much larger than a pin's point i see it he said relinquishing the glass but i do not understand what it means it is a dutch metal or gold leaf the book from which this sheet was cut was gilt-edged that disposes of the volumes of leisure hour and other bound periodicals none of which is gilt-edged when i was looking at the books at the farm i noticed only two with gilt-edged leaves one was the big family bible and the other was a large old-fashioned language of flowers but this sheet could not have been cut from the language of flowers why not because it has two rounded corners as a rule only sacred books and poetry are bound with rounded corners in any case i remember that the language of flowers at the farm is square-edged therefore the sheet on which the cryptogram has been drawn was cut from the bible the next question that faced me was how the numbers had been used they did not represent the numbers of the pages i was sure of that the bible is a book in which figures are used freely in the arrangement of the contents the pages are numbered the chapters are divided into verses which are numbered and there is a numbered table of contents at the beginning of each chapter obviously the bible is an excellent book from which to devise a cryptogram of numbers owing to the multiplicity of figures used in it and the variety of ways in which they are arranged i found both a bible and a prayer book in the bookshelves here and set to work to study the numerical arrangement of the chapters the divisions of the verses and the arrangement of figures at the head of the chapters it was while i was thus engaged that i remembered that at the beginning of the authorized version of the bible is inserted a table of the books of the old and new testaments the pages on which they begin and the number of chapters in each here was the possibility of a starting point sufficiently unusual to make a good concealment yet not too remote i turned to the table and on running my eye down it i saw that the psalms and the psalms alone contain one hundred fifty chapters now the first line of central figures in the cryptogram is one hundred fifty i was really fortunate in starting off with this discovery because otherwise i might have been led off the track by the doubling and trebling of the three in the second line of central figures and have wasted time trying to fathom some mystic interpretation of the nine a numeral which has always had a special significance for humanity the nine muses the nine worthies dressed up to the nines and so on but with one hundred fifty as the indication that the cryptogram had been composed from the book of psalms it was obvious that the next line of numerals in the centre directed attention to some particular portion of them 
as there are not three hundred ninety six verses in any chapter of the psalms just what i was going to point out broke in marsland quite so but it was possible that three ninety six meant psalms thirty nine six therefore i turned to the thirty ninth psalm verse six of that psalm reads surely every man walketh in a vain shoe surely they are disquieted in vain he heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather appropriate enough commented marsland there remain the final six under the three ninety six to be explained before i was able to start on the table which had been used to build up the cryptogram the fact that the figures in the outside circle start at six indicated that there was some connection between it and the inner six i came to the conclusion that the inner six meant one of two things either the designer preferred to start from the number six because he thought the figure one was too clear an indication of the commencement of his cryptogram or else he made his start from the sixth letter of the text i thought the former the likelier solution but i tried them both to make sure the first five figures on the latter solution gave me a recurring y which indicated that i was on the wrong track because it was essential that there should be no recurring letters there are no recurring letters in the other key as the table shows readers note the table has rows of consecutive numbers beginning with the number six the psalms thirty nine verse six passage is placed in rows beneath these numbers each letter directly under a number below each of the letters of the verse is another row of numbers beginning with one instead of six and again in sequential order so that where there is a six above the letter for example there is a one below it seven above the next letter has a two beneath it etc end of reader's note the circle of figures taken in their ascending order and starting with the second six run thus six eight nine ten eleven thirteen seventeen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty three twenty five twenty six twenty seven thirty nine fifty one fifty four seventy two eighty eighty nine now assuming that my interpretation of the solitary six in the circle is correct that the old man started from six because he thought the use of the figure one gave away too much we will substitute for these figures the letters which appear underneath them in the table the substitution gives us the following row of letters s r e l y v m n w a k t h i u d q p c o s this is the line of letters from which we will endeavor to reconstruct the old man's cryptogram we can i think go forward with the assurance that they are the actual letters represented by the cryptogram for several reasons there are no recurring letters and they represent every letter in the text in consecutive order with three exceptions which are capable of a simple explanation the u has been taken from the second surely instead of the first to mislead the solver otherwise you would have surely for the first five numbers which would be too clear an indication the same reason exists for making a the tenth letter instead of the eighth which would reveal the word man the final letter the g in gather has been excluded for a reason which i will presently explain what about the second s the final letter 
do you not call that a recurring letter asked marsland who was closely examining the table the detective had prepared not in the cryptographic sense it is the first letter of the text repeated after the line had been completed without recurring letters there is a special reason for its use the old man has worked on what is called the keyword cipher which is the most difficult of all ciphers to discover this system consists of various arrangements more or less elaborate of tables of letters set down in the form of the multiplication table and from the table agreed upon messages are constructed whose solution depends on the use of some preconcerted keyword the most scientific adaptation of this principle was constructed by admiral sir francis beaufort in his system the letters of the alphabet are set down one under another from a to z then a is added to the line the next line starts with b and runs to another b at the bottom you continue till you have the whole alphabet set down in this fashion from this table an agreed keyword which may consist of a proper name or a sentence of several words you construct a cipher message how asked marsland in a tone of keen interest that is what i now propose to demonstrate to you if as i think the old man constructed his cryptogram in accordance with this principle i have come to the conclusion that he modified and adapted this system to his own ends using the letters of the text from the bible to conceal it better and then made it more difficult still by turning the letters into figures after the manner i have described he has also made a slight but not uncommon variation from the beaufort principle by striking out the g in gather which would follow the o if every letter in the text was used once and substituting the final s instead of placing the s after g but the clue that suggested to my mind that he had worked on this principle are the two figures six coming together at the top of the circle in the substituted letters they form two s's now why does he have two s's when he carefully avoids recurring letters in the rest of the table and why did he insert the first s again as represented by the figure six instead of taking the next s in this table in pondering over these points i discovered as i believe the system of cryptogram he used to construct his secret he wanted to make the cryptogram difficult of solution but at the same time he wanted to give some indication of the form of cryptogram he was using when his heirs came to search for the money the recurring s indicates that he was working on a modification of the system i have explained in which you add the first letter of your first column to the bottom and continue on that system throughout the table it is not much of a hint because we have got to find the key word before we can use the table but by its help we will start with the assumption that the old man worked on the following table readers note a table is shown using the letters of the psalms verse these letters run in rows and columns taking the form of an acrostic end of readers note it is from this table unless i am very much mistaken that he constructed the cipher at the top of the sheet said crewe marsland examined the curious table of letters with close scrutiny from various points of view finally reversing it and examining it upside down he returned it to crewe with a disappointed shake of his head i can make nothing of it he said it is necessary for us to discover the key word he worked on before we can make use of it said crewe once we get the key word we will have no trouble in deciphering the mysterious message 
the key word is the real difficulty in ciphers of this kind it is like the key word of a combination lock without it you cannot unlock the cipher it is absolutely insoluble suppose for example he had picked a word at random out of the dictionary and died without divulging it to anybody we should have to go through the dictionary word for word working the table on each word till we came to the right one but that would take years exclaimed marsland blankly unless we hit on it by a lucky accident that is why the keyword cipher is practically insoluble without knowledge of the key word it is not even necessary to have a word a prearranged code of letters will do known only to the composer of the cryptogram if he wanted anybody else to decipher his cryptogram he would have to divulge to him not only the form of table he worked on but the code of letters forming the key word well i do not see we are much further forward said marsland despondently of course it is very clever of you to have found out what you have but we are helpless without the key word the old man is not likely to have divulged it to anybody you are wrong said crewe he has divulged it to whom to this paper as i said before he did not want his cryptogram to be insoluble he wanted his heirs to have his money but he did not want it found very easily you have forgotten the texts at the bottom of the paper they have not been placed there for nothing the key word is hidden in them i forgot all about the texts i was so interested in your reconstruction of the cryptogram said marsland as you say he didn't put the texts there for nothing so it seems likely that he has hidden the key word in them but even now we may have some difficulty in finding it do you propose to take the texts word for word testing each with the table till you find the right one that would take a long while said crewe i hope to simplify the process considerably in fact i think i have already discovered the key word you have exclaimed marsland in astonishment how have you managed that by deduction from the facts in front of us or perhaps i should say by reflecting on the hints placed in the texts isn't there something about those texts that strikes you as peculiar marsland examined them attentively for some time and shook his head i'm afraid i'm not sufficiently well up in the scriptures to notice anything peculiar about them i should say they were from the old testament but i couldn't tell you what part of it the texts are from the old testament from jeremiah twenty five and isaiah seven they are remarkable for the fact that they represent two passages the only two instances in the whole bible where the writers used cryptograms to hide their actual meaning in the first instance the prophet jeremiah living in dangerous times veils his attack on the king of babylon by writing shishak for babel babylon that is instead of using b b l the second and twelfth letters of the hebrew alphabet from the beginning he wrote s h s h k from the end a simple form of cryptogram which is frequently used even now in the second instance the prophet isaiah working on a very similar form of cryptogram writes tabial for remalia now we are faced by two facts concerning the presence of these two texts on the paper containing the cryptogram in the first place the cryptogram was complete without the texts for what purpose then could they have been at the bottom of the sheet except to give a clue to the discovery of that key word without which no recovery of the hidden treasure was possible unless it was found by a lucky chance in the second place 
the selection by the old man of the only two cryptographic texts in the bible was certainly not chance but part of a deliberate harmonious design to guide the intelligent searcher to the right keyword he was evidently versed in cryptography constructed this one as carefully as a mechanic putting together a piece of mechanism fitting all the parts carefully into one another the figures in the center of the circle give the key to the outside figures the outside figures are the key to the cryptographic table of letters from which the cryptogram is to be solved there remains the key to be found it is not likely that the composer of such an ingenious cryptogram would leave the keyword to guesswork the whole thing is a bible cryptogram from first to last figures letters words and texts it is even drawn on a sheet cut from the bible why such an act might be deemed irreverent in a deeply religious man like the old man was but when we piece the thing together we find that he was actuated by a religious spirit throughout not the least skilful part of his cryptogram is his concealment of the key word in the text at the bottom the text would convey nothing to most people for very few people know anything about cryptograms still fewer people would know that these texts contain the only two cryptograms in the bible therefore in accordance with his harmonious design it seems to me that the key word should be found in the five alternatives of the cryptic texts babel babylon shishak ramalia or tabial babel and babylon may be discarded because there is no letter b in the cryptographic table and it is essential that the key word shall contain no letter which doesn't also appear in the table shishak may also be discarded for the present as unlikely because of the awkwardness of the recurring s h in a key word there remain tabial and remalia the tendency of the composer would be to use the longer word because a long key word is the better for the purpose i think therefore we should first try whether remalia is the key word we are in search of by jove crew that is cleverly reasoned out exclaimed marsland in some excitement let's put it to the test how do we apply this keyword to the table easily enough on this sheet of paper we will write down the cryptogram and the key word underneath it letter for letter thus t y n m v r t t h s m r e m a l i a h r e m now the first word of the cryptogram is t look in the first column of the table for it and then run your eye across the table for the first letter of the key word when you have found it look at the top of the column and tell me the letter k said marsland very well then we put down k as the first word of the solution and proceed in like manner through the whole of the cipher the second letter is y find it in the table then look across for the second letter of the key e and then to the top of the column what letter have you c said marsland k c then are the first two letters of our solution and we go on to the third always repeating the same process n in the first column m across and the top gives you o said marsland the next letter is m in the cryptogram and a in the key word what does the top of the column give you l replied marsland but i say crew do you think we are on the right track k c o l is a queer start for a word isn't it i know of no word commencing like that 
i may be mistaken but i do not think so replied crewe firmly let us keep on till we finished it at all events they resumed their task and ultimately brought out the letters k c o l c h c r a e s marsland gazed at the result in dismay <laughs> by jove we're on the wrong track he said ruefully it is the wrong word crew these letters mean nothing you'll have to try again but crewe did not reply he was examining the result of his night's labors closely suddenly he put down the paper with an unusual light in his eye no he said i am right the old man was thorough to the last detail he has given another clue to his heirs in the circle and the two lines they represent a clock face but the figures round them run the reverse way to clock figures the cryptogram reads backwards hold it up to that mirror and see marsland did so and laid down the paper with a look of bewilderment search clock the old grandfather clock at cliff farm he said End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the mystery of the downs by john watson and arthur j rees this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva chapter twenty four as the car swept around the deserted sea front and through the scattered outskirts of the town crewe gradually increased the going till by the time staveley was left behind and the cliff road stretched in front of them his powerful car was driving along at top speed the night was not dark for the time of year the windings of the road were visible some distance ahead from the cliffs the rollers of the incoming tide could be seen breaking into white froth on the rocks below it has occurred to me that for a man who was afraid of a german invasion old lumsden selected a very bad hiding-place for his money said marsland he could not have known the reputation the german soldiers made for themselves in stealing french clocks in the war of eighteen seventy perhaps not replied crewe but i do not think he intended to leave the money in the clock when the germans came if he fled from the farm he would have taken it with him his object in hiding it in the clock was to have it constantly under his eye the car mounted the hill to the cutting through the cliff road near their destination and as the road dipped downwards crewe slackened the pace both of them were looking across towards the farm on the left as it came into view crewe exclaimed to his companion did you see that a light said marsland excitedly it is gone now it was probably a match there must be someone there i wonder who it could be perhaps it is gillette we will soon see no we will drive past it may be someone who wants to escape being seen we will run the car off the road a little way down past the farm then extinguish the lights and make our way back he increased the pace of the car so that if there was any one at the farm it would appear that the car was going to ashlingsea they both kept their eyes on the house as the car sped past but there was no repetition of the flash of light they had seen less than half a mile away crewe shut off the engine and carefully ran the car off the road on to a grassy path he extinguished the lights and jumped out of the car he took an electric torch from his overcoat pocket and after turning it on to see if it was in order he set off in the direction of the farm we will not keep to the road as there may be someone on the watch he said follow me i know my way across the fields he clambered over the gate of a field and set off at a run with marsland following him closely he led the way over ditches and across hedges and fences until they reached the meadow at the side of the farm before climbing the low brick wall crewe waited for marsland you watch the front of the house while i go to the back if you see any one challenge him in a loud voice so that i can hear you and i'll come to your assistance if i want you i'll call out they climbed the wall and dropped noiselessly on to the grass 
crewe waited until marsland had taken up his station behind a plum tree in the garden then crept towards the kitchen door he stood outside the door listening intently for a few minutes but as he heard no sound he selected the right key from the bunch he had borrowed from gillette and turned the lock he waited to see if the sound of the turning lock had alarmed any one inside the house slowly he turned the handle opened the door and stepped noiselessly into the kitchen a few minutes later marsland heard him approaching him from the back of the house come quickly he said some one has been before us and found the money but he is coming back again marsland silently followed crewe along the side of the house to the kitchen and into the room where the great grandfather clock stood crewe flashed the torch on it and marsland started back with a cry of astonishment the wooden case had been smashed beyond repair it had been hacked and splintered with a heavy weapon which had not only battered in the front of the case but smashed the back as well pieces of the wood had been pulled off and flung about the room about the bottom of the broken case several sovereigns were lying the treasure he cried it was here then has he got away with it most of it but not all of it said crewe see here he knelt down by the case plunged in his hand and drew forth a canvas bag which clinked as he held it up this is the sort of bag that banks use for holding sovereigns the banks put a thousand sovereigns into each bag and seal it up so as to render it unnecessary to count the coins every time the bags are handled there are four of these bags still here but where are they hidden asked marsland in amazement where did you find this one wasn't it lying on the floor when you came in the old man devised a skilful hiding-place said crewe he fitted the case with a false back and stowed his treasure in between look here he flashed the light around the interior of the case and marsland looking closely saw that the back of it which had been smashed was a false one skilfully let in about three inches in front of the real back in the space between the two backs the eccentric old owner of cliff farm had concealed his treasure as he had obtained it from the bank it is an ingenious hiding-place said crewe he laid the clock on its face took off the back fitted his false slide into a groove stacked in his money-bags replaced the proper back and then restored the clock to its original position you see he was careful to make the space between the false and the real backs so narrow that there was very little possibility of the hiding-place being discovered by chance or suspicion even the man who has forestalled us with the solution of the cryptogram was unable to discover the treasure until he had recourse to the clumsy method of smashing up the clock this is what he used to do it crewe pointed to an axe lying near with that he smashed the case found the treasure and carried off what he could he would be able to carry four of these bags at a time two in each hand he has left these four for another trip how many trips he has already made i do not know but probably more than one he may be back again at any moment said marsland lowering his voice to a whisper hadn't we better hide he won't be back just yet said crewe confidently what makes you so certain of that he was here when we saw the flash of light that is less than half an hour ago to walk from here with four of these bags to the cliff down the path in the dark to the boat he has waiting for him would take more than half an hour but what makes you think he has a boat why do you feel sure he has come by sea because that is the better way to come if he wanted to escape observation if he came by road he would have brought a vehicle and would have taken the whole of the treasure away in a few minutes but in a vehicle he might be met along the road by some one who knew him have you any idea who it is asked marsland some one who has solved the cryptogram or got it solved for him said crewe by making a tour of the second-hand bookshops in london he probably got in touch with some one who has made a study of cryptograms and in that way got it solved there are some strange human types in these big second-hand bookshops in london strange old men full of unexpected information in all sorts of subjects but how 
did he get a copy of the cryptogram could he have got possession of the copy i found on the stairs i think so how miss maynard gave it to him miss maynard echoed the young man how could she have got it she left the house with me and did not come back in fact she was very much opposed to coming back when i suggested that we should do so in order to get it if she had it in her possession at the house her opposition to your proposal to go back for it is quite reasonable i think you said that after you found the dead body upstairs she rushed downstairs and waited outside for you she had ample time to go into the room and take the cryptogram from the table where you placed it doubtless her main thought was that its presence might implicate brett in some way then it is brett who has taken this money and is carrying it down the cliff to the boat said marsland excitedly yes probably miss maynard is down at the boat keeping guard over the bags as he brings them and you think he will come back here for the rest asked marsland crewe noted the eagerness in the young man's voice it seemed as if marsland was excited by the thought of meeting brett he is not likely to leave four thousand pounds behind unless he knows the place is being watched let us go towards the cliffs and meet him declared marsland impatiently to think that i am to meet him face to face and here of all places we might miss him in the dark and he might get clean away where shall we hide asked the young man again sinking his voice to a whisper he may reach here any moment now he came in by the front door the lock has not been injured so apparently he has a key you hide in the room on the left just inside close to the door i will hide in the cupboard underneath the staircase when he reaches the clock he cannot escape without passing us give him time to get the money and as soon as he has the bags in his hands ready to start off we will both spring out at him crewe watched marsland enter the sitting-room on the left and then opened the door of the cupboard beneath the staircase and crouched down the cupboard opened into the hall and through the crack of the door crewe was able to see into the room where the shattered clock was the door of the room where mosland was hidden also commanded a view of the interior of the room in which the clock stood the stillness was so complete that crewe could hear the watch in his pocket ticking off the ebbing moments once the distant yelp of a sheep-dog reached him then there was another long period of stillness twice his keen ear caught a faint creaking in the old house but he knew they were but the mysterious night noises which are so common in all old houses the querulous creakings and complaints of beams and joists which have seen many human generations come and go but as the time dragged on without a sound to indicate that the thief was returning crewe found to his vexation that he had increasing difficulty in keeping his senses alert in that dark and muffled silence the close and confined atmosphere of the cupboard the lack of air his cramped position compelled an unconquerable drowsiness then he heard a sound which drove away his drowsiness the sound of a key in a lock he heard the door creak as it was pushed back and then came steps advancing along the hall stumbling along noisily as though their owner thought that the need for precautions ceased when the front door was passed that once inside the house he was safe and need not fear interruption there was a scrape and a splutter and a flickering flame in the hall the thief had struck a match through the crack of the cupboard door crewe watched the tiny blue flame grow larger turn yellow and burn steadily and he could see the dim outline of a man's back and a hand shielding the match showing transparent through the flame the thief had struck his match with his face to the doorway the outline of his other hand approached and the light grew brighter the intruder had lit a piece of candle as it burnt up the man turned towards the clock and crewe saw the face of brett for the first time his impression was of a pair of hunted nervous eyes roving restlessly in a livid waxen mask a tense sucked-in mouth he saw no more apparently marsland had been too excited to wait until the thief had the bags in his hands 
for brett started as though he heard a movement and quickly extinguished his candle there was a moment of intense silence and then crewe heard marsland's voice raised in a strange high-pitched scream that made it seem unfamiliar powell you traitor and murderer i am marsland captain marsland i will kill you without sending you to trial crewe had thrown open the door of the cupboard at the first sound of the voice but before he could get to his feet there was the deafening sound of a revolver shot followed by the rush of feet and the fall of a body the bullet had missed the thief and marsland advancing on him after firing had been knocked over by brett's rush for the door before crewe could reach him across marsland's prostrate form brett had thrown open the door and was outside the house crewe dashed for the door in pursuit he caught a glimpse of a fleeing figure bent nearly double to shield himself from another shot running down the gravel path at amazing speed then the figure was swallowed up in the night crewe followed without waiting to find out how marsland had fared he failed to catch another glimpse of brett but had no doubt he would make for the path down the cliff about a quarter of a mile away crewe who had been a long distance runner at school was in excellent training knew that he would last the distance better than brett he caught sight of brett again before half the distance between the downs and the cliffs had been covered a fantastic flying figure bobbing into view against the skyline for an instant as he ran across the crest of a little hill and as suddenly disappeared again but that brief glimpse of the fugitive revealed to crewe that brett had mistaken his course he was running too much to the right crewe ran on steadily in a straight line for the path when brett discovered that he had run too wide he would have to curve back taking almost a semicircular course before he reached the beginning of the path crewe's course was the shorter the cord to brett's bow and would bring him to the path before brett could possibly reach it the detective slackened pace slightly and cast a glance over his shoulder to see if marsland was following him but he could not see him crewe reached the hidden path and waited listening by the bushes which concealed the entrance soon his quick ear caught the pad of footsteps and as they drew nearer they were accompanied by the quick breathing of a man running hard then the form of brett loomed up running straight for the path crewe sprang at him as he came close but the runner saw his danger in time to fling himself sideways he was on his feet again in an instant and made away along the edge of the cliff bounding along with great jumps among the rocks from point to point and rock to rock crewe drew so close that he could hear brett's panting breath as he ran but each time brett with a desperate spurt put a few more yards between them again once he staggered and seemed about to fall but he sprang up again and ran with the speed of a hare they had reached the rocky headland which jutted into the sea a hundred yards or more by the dangerous turn of the cliff road crewe slackened his pace to call out a warning to the man he was pursuing look out or you'll fall over the cliff he cried brett paused turned irresolutely and then began slowly to retrace his steps but as he did so a figure appeared suddenly out of the gloom and dashed past crewe towards him you dog i have you screamed marsland you cannot get away from me again look out marsland cried crewe springing after him you'll both go over marsland ran on without heeding cursing savagely at the hunted man brett had fled away again at the sound of his voice and crewe could hear his gasping breath as he stumbled over the slippery rocks the two figures appeared clearly against the skyline for a moment as they raced towards the end of the headland then the foremost disappeared over the cliff with a scream brett endeavouring to double in his tracks at the edge of the headland had slipped and gone over marsland was standing on the edge of the cliff peering down into the sea mist which veiled the water below when crewe reached his side crewe drew him back come away if you don't want to follow him he said we shall have to get the police out to look for his body but perhaps the sea will carry it away End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the mystery of the downs by john watson and arthur j rees this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva chapter twenty five 
the search for the body began in the morning at low tide inspector murchison had come from staveley to superintend and from the landing-place he and sergeant westaway directed the operations of the ashlingsea fishermen who had been engaged to make the search some of the townspeople who had walked up from the town to witness the proceedings thought that the body would be swept out to sea and never recovered but the fishermen with a deeper knowledge of a treacherous piece of sea from which they wrested their living shook their heads if the gentleman had fallen in near the deep water of the landing-place the undercurrent might have carried him out into the channel but there were too many reefs and sandbanks running out from the headland and too many cross-currents to let a body be carried out to sea they gave it as their opinion that the body would be found before high tide either in one of the shallows near the big sandbank a quarter of a mile out or in one of the pools between the reefs whose jagged pointed edges showed above the surface of the sea nearer the headland the sea lay grey and still under an october sky of dull silver the boats as they came out from ashling sea put in at the landing-place to receive the instructions of the police officers standing there and then started to search there were two rowers in each boat and standing at the stern was a man holding the rope to which the grappling irons were attached slowly and mechanically the boats were rowed out some distance to sea and then rowed back again the men in the stern watched the ropes in their hands for the first sign of tautness which would indicate that the grappling irons had hooked into something frequently one of the irons caught on a piece of rock and when this happened the boat had to be eased back until the irons could be released the boats searching further out near the sandbank used nets instead of grappling irons crewe who had driven over in his car from staveley after watching this scene for some time turned back to the road in order to put up his car at cliff farm marsland had not accompanied him the young man had motored over with his uncle who after hearing from his nephew a full account of the events of the previous night had insisted on participating in the search for the missing man sir george granville on arriving at the headland had scrambled down the cliff with some idea of assisting in the search and at the present moment was standing on the landing-place with inspector murchison gesticulating to the rowers and pointing out likely spots which he thought had escaped their attention crewe on regaining his car found marsland leaning against it contemplating the scene before him with indifferent eyes he nodded briefly to the detective and then averted his eyes crewe explained his intention regarding the car and marsland said he might as well go down with him he got up into the front seat with the same listlessness that had characterized his previous actions but did not speak again till they reached the farm at the house crewe and marsland met detective Gillette who had gone there to store his bicycle preparatory to watching the operations of the fishermen searching for the body i have had a pretty busy time since you came along to us last night he said referring to the visit of crewe and marsland to ashling sea police station to report the fall of bread over the cliff we got the money twelve thousand pounds altogether there was eight thousand in the motor-boat and four thousand here in the bottom of the old clock case as you said what about the girl asked crewe was she there detective gillette looked in the direction of marsland before replying the young man with the same air of detachment that had marked his previous actions had wandered some distance down the gravel walk and was carelessly tossing pebbles from the path at some object which was not apparent to the two men in the porch i found her searching along the cliffs with a lantern said gillette in a low voice she was looking for brett she told me that she had heard a scream and she thought he must have fallen over accidentally i didn't enlighten her poor thing she is half demented she has got it into her head that she is responsible for some document or paper which brett had given into her safe-keeping and which she handed back to him last night at his request before he went to the farm to look for the money 
doesn't she know what is in the paper asked crewe quickly her mind is in such a state that it is useless to question her she keeps repeating that it was to be opened in the event of his death it was only after great difficulty i ascertained from her that she had given the paper back to brett last night i am anxious that brett's body should be recovered in order to ascertain what its contents are i should think the girl would have a fair idea of the contents i think so too but she is not in a fit state to be questioned at present and may not be for some time the strain has been too much for her in my opinion she is in for a severe illness where is she now at the station of course i had to take her into custody on a charge of attempting to steal this money whether the public prosecutor will go on with the charge or whether he will bring any other charge of a more serious nature against her remains to be seen marsland who had abandoned his stone throwing had strolled back to the porch in time to hear gillette's last remarks it is a strange thing to find a girl of her type in love with such a scoundrel he said quite a common thing said detective gillette speaking from the experience of the seamy side of life which comes under the attention of scotland yard there are some women brought up in good surroundings who seem to be attracted irresistibly to scoundrels you never know what a woman will do by the by it is a good thing mr marsland that you did not hit him when you fired at him last night if you had killed him i should have had to arrest you and the case would have had to go to a jury of course there is no doubt how it would have ended but it would have been an unpleasant experience for you i shouldn't have minded that was the young man's answer gillette regarded this declaration as bravado and merely continued as it is you are virtually responsible for his death in frightening him over the cliff but the law takes no account of that i should prefer to have shot him said marsland ah well i must get away and see what they are doing said the scotland yard detective who obviously disliked marsland's attitude i suppose i'll see you again during the day when he had gone off towards the cliffs crewe turned to marsland and said i am going to have another look at the place now that this case is concluded he entered the house and marsland followed him the interior looked more sombre and deserted than ever the fortnight which had elapsed since the tragedy during which time the place had been left untenanted had intensified the air of desolation and neglect that brooded over the empty rooms had thickened the dust on the moth-eaten carpets and heavy old furniture and gave an uncanny air to the staring eyes of the stuffed animals which hung on the wall in glass cases dead pets of dead occupants of cliff farm crewe and marsland looked through the house entered the room where the grandfather clock stood and crewe pointed out the mark of the bullet which marsland had fired at brett the previous night in his excitement he had fired too high and the bullet had gone into the wall about eight feet from the floor between two photographs which hung on the wall one of these photographs was of james lumsden the eccentric old owner of cliff farm who had broken his neck by falling downstairs the other was a frank lumsden whose dead body had been found in the house by marsland thirteen days before that was the second time i missed brett said marsland staring at the bullet hole in the wall between the photographs the second time echoed crewe do you mean that he was the burglar at whom you fired a week ago yes i came into the room just as he was getting out of the window i caught only a glimpse of him but i knew him instantly i had a presentiment that he was near and that is why i happened to be wearing my revolver what was his object in breaking into the house he wanted to be sure that i was the man he had to fear just as i wanted to be sure that he was the man i wanted to kill an hour before i had broken into his rooms at forty one whitethorn gardens for the purpose of making sure about him i saw his photograph there and that is all that i wanted and it was you and not he who was in the house when mrs penfield called out that the police were in the house 
yes that was i i didn't understand why she called out but it served as a warning to me that she expected him and so when i got back to my uncle's i got my revolver out of the drawer the first i heard of him being in england was when inspector murchison told us although i was prepared in a way after finding that lumsden had been here murchison spoke of him as brett but i did not know him by that name so to make sure i got mrs penfield out of the house by a hoax on the telephone broke into the place in her absence i did not know that it was you who came back with her but his object in breaking into your room was probably to get some article of yours which would help to bring suspicion against you with regard to lumsden's death no doubt it was he who took the glasses which were subsequently found in the well as you lost a pair of glasses in the storm and arrived at the farm without them miss maynard probably mentioned the fact to brett did you tell her that you had lost your glasses that night i forget oh yes i did i mentioned it when we were looking at the cryptogram on the stairs he was certainly an enterprising scoundrel don't you wish to know why i wanted to kill him asked the young man after a pause i do very much i feel that i must speak about it he said and you are the only man to whom i can you heard murchison tell us that lumsden and brett as he called himself had been tortured by the germans but that they gave away no information that is their version let me tell you the truth about them both of them belonged to my company in france lumsden had been under me for four or five months and i had nothing against him he was a fairly good soldier and i thought i could depend upon him powell or brett had come over with a recent draft one night when i was holding a short advanced trench to the south of armentieres i sent lumsden and brett out on a listening patrol the trench we were holding was reached through a sap it was the first of four or five that were being dug as jumping-off places for an attack on the german trenches it was just about midnight that i sent lumsden and brett out and they ought to have been back by two a m it was the middle of summer and dawn commenced about three a m either they had been captured or had lost their way and were waiting for dawn when it was light enough to see the landscape two figures appeared on the parapet of a german trench in front about three hundred yards away they were calling and gesticulating at us at that distance it was impossible to make out what they were saying but from their gestures we gathered that the germans had deserted the trench and it was ours if we liked to go over and occupy it it came as such a surprise that none of us stopped to think but if we had stopped no one would have thought of treachery the men went over the parapet every one of them it was a race they were laughing and joking as to who should be there first and when we were within forty yards or so there was a volley from rifles and machine-guns the bullets seemed to come from every quarter the men were taken by surprise and they dropped almost before they had time to realize what had happened i was one of the first to go down but it was only a bullet in the leg as i lay where i fell i was struck by another bullet in the shoulder then i crawled to a shell hole for shelter i found seven of my men there all of whom had been hit we were not there long before the germans commenced to lob hand grenades into the shell hole how i escaped death i do not know it was an awful experience to see those murderous bombs coming down and to be powerless to escape from them i saw several of my poor men with limbs blown off dying in agony and from what i learned subsequently much of the same thing had happened in other shell holes where men had crawled for shelter out of my company of eighty-two we were not at full strength and i had only three second lieutenants besides myself i was the only one to come through alive and i lay in a state of semi-collapse in the shell hole for two days before being rescued when our men drove the germans out of their trenches a dreadful experience said crewe sympathetically these two miserable loathsome creatures brett and lumsden to save their own lives 
had beckoned my company into the trap they had been captured by the germans and no doubt were tortured in order to make them do what they did but as british soldiers they should have died under torture rather than be guilty of treachery the memory of how my poor men died without having a chance to defend themselves haunts me day and night i hear their voices their curses as they realize that they were the victims of a horrible act of treachery their cries and moans in the agony of death he sat down on the upturned clock case and buried his face in his hands End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the mystery of the downs by john watson and arthur j rees this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva chapter twenty six am i the first man to whom you have told this story asked crewe in a gentle voice yes said marsland it is not a story that i would care to tell to many it is not a story that reflects any credit on me my company wiped out through treachery on the part of two of my men but when you came back to england wouldn't it have been better to have reported the matter to the military authorities and have had brett and lumsden tried by court-martial i did not know they were in england until i came down here i thought that if they were not dead they were prisoners in germany i have no witnesses for a court-martial and after being off my head in the hospital for a couple of months i doubt if a court-martial would believe my story counsel for the defence would say i was suffering from delusions and it would have driven me mad if such a scoundrel as brett had been acquitted by a court-martial for want of evidence besides the satisfaction of having him shot was not to be compared with the satisfaction of shooting him down myself just as if he were a dog but it is a terribly grave thing to take a human life to send a man to his death without trial i have seen so many men die crew that death seems to me but a little thing if a man deserves death if he knows himself that he deserves it a hundredfold why waste time in proving it to others if i had shot brett i should doubtless have had to stand my trial for murder but if the police searched all over england could they have found a jury who would convict me if i saw fit to tell my story in the dock told by a man in the dock it would carry conviction but told by a man in the witness-box at a court-martial it might not i believe there is some truth in that said crewe in a firm quiet voice but it is a matter which must be put to the test marsland stood up and fixed on him an intent gaze what do you mean he said if brett is dead he died by accident by a fall over the cliff the law cannot touch me the detective did not speak but his eyes held the young man's glance intently for a moment and then travelled slowly to the portrait of frank lumsden on the wall i mean that he said slowly do you know all marsland asked in a voice which was little more than a whisper i know that it was you who shot frank lumsden yes i shot him the young man sprang to his feet and uttered the words in a loud excited tone which rang through the empty house and so little do i regret what i have done that if i had the chance to recall the past i would not falter i would shoot him again sit down again said crewe kindly do not excite yourself you and i can discuss this thing quietly whatever else is to happen afterwards how long have you known that i did it asked marsland after a pause it was not until yesterday that i felt quite certain what annoys me what offends my personal pride is that my impetuous young friend gillette picked you out as the right man before i did he was wrong in his facts wrong in his deductions wrong in his theories 
and hopelessly wrong in his reconstruction of the crime he had no more chance of proving a case against you than against the first man he might pick out blindfolded from a crowd and yet he was right true he came to the conclusion that he was wrong when i put him right as to the circumstances under which the tragedy occurred but that doesn't soothe my pride altogether if there is one lesson i have learned from this case it is that humility is a virtue that becomes us all but after all i do not think i have been so very long in solving the problem the detective continued it is only thirteen days since the tragedy took place and from the first i saw it was a complicated case i never ruled out the possibility of your being the right man after brett and miss maynard tried to sheet home lumsden's death to you i do not think she was fully in brett's confidence in fact it is fairly obvious that he would not tell her the story of his treachery but he knew that you had shot lumsden and she caught at his conviction without being fully convinced herself brett's conduct was inconsistent with guilt but it was consistent with the knowledge that lumsden had met his death at your hands and that he himself would share the same fate if you encountered him i am under the impression that he reached lumsden a few minutes after you rode away from the spot and that lumsden was then alive probably he was able to breathe out your name to brett the latter helped the dying man into the motor-car and started to drive back to staveley for medical aid and after passing the thatched cottage on the right he became aware that lumsden had collapsed and was past human aid so he decided to take the body to the farm and in order to disappear without drawing immediate suspicion on himself he tried to indicate that lumsden was shot in the house then he disappeared because he was afraid of you if he had got you under lock and key he might have risked coming into the open and giving evidence against you but i rather fancy that his intention was to get away to a foreign country with old lumsden's money and then put the police on your track by giving the true circumstances under which lumsden was shot did he write to you asked marsland no i was always afraid he would what put you on my track the conviction that you had warned this girl to clear out as gillette had obtained some awkward facts against her you were the only person who had any object in warning her though gillette thinks you had even less reason to do so than brett i regarded you merely as an average human being and not actuated by quixotic impulses i remembered that she had tried to sheet home the crime to you and therefore you had little cause to be grateful to her so far i am in accord with gillette but if you knew that she had nothing to do with the tragedy and if you felt that gillette's close questioning might lead to information from brett which would tell against you it was common sense on your part to get her out of the way it is wonderful how you have divined my mind and the line of thought i followed said the young man his even tones were an indication that he was regaining his composure next there was your attempt to kill brett instead of helping me to capture him that told against you true it indicated that you had what you regarded as a just cause of deadly hatred but if you were under the belief that brett had killed lumsden it would have suited you better to capture him than to shoot him your shot at brett showed me that you knew it was not brett who had killed lumsden and also that you feared if brett were arrested he would charge you with shooting lumsden go on 
said the young man breathlessly there is little more to tell said crewe i had to ask gillette yesterday not to refer to the doubts i had expressed to him regarding brett's guilt i was afraid he might do so in your presence and that would have put you on your guard the final proof came when gillette discovered the bullet in the tree where lumsden fell at the moment gillette found the bullet i picked up these in the grass crewe produced from his waistcoat pocket a pair of eyeglasses so that is where i lost them exclaimed marsland it never occurred to me before i have no recollection of their dropping off i suppose i was too excited to notice they had gone your meeting with him was accidental said crewe quite i had been out riding on the downs and when i struck the road i wasn't sure which way i had to go to get home i saw a man coming along the road and i rode up to him it was lumsden i tell you crewe he was terrified at the sight of me no doubt he thought that i had been killed in france as i was dismounting and tying up my horse he pleaded for his life he grovelled at my feet in the dirt but i did not waste much time or pity i told him that he had earned death a hundredfold and that the only thing i was sorry for was that i could kill him only once he sprang up the bank in the hope of getting away but i brought him down with a single shot i saw that he was done for and i left him gasping in the agony of death i had no pity i had seen so many men die and i had seen my company of good men go to their deaths because of his treachery i rode back over the downs and caring little which way i went i lost my way and was overtaken by the storm eventually i saw the farm and went there for shelter and upstairs i found the dead body of this man lumsden it was the strangest experience of my life i did not know what to think i could not make out how the body had got there and when miss maynard asked me to say nothing to the police about her having been there i thought it was the least i could do for her i knew that whatever errand had brought her there she had nothing to do with his death there was a long pause during which the two men looked at one another you think that i had just cause for shooting him said marsland i think you had no right to take upon yourself the responsibility of saying the law will fail to punish these men and therefore i will punish them without invoking the aid of the law i do not regret what i have done as i said before if i had to go through it again i would not hesitate to shoot him perhaps it is because i have lived so much with death while i was at the front that human life does not seem to me a sacred thing these two men deserved death if ever men did you believe that no jury would convict you said crewe i do not see how a jury of patriotic englishmen could do so but i do not care about that i have finished with my life i do not care what becomes of me when i recall what i have been through over there in france when i think of the thousands of brave men who have died agonized deaths when i see again the shattered mutilated bodies of my men in the shell hole with me i want to forget that i have ever lived all that remains to be done is that you should hand me over to the police that is a responsibility which i should like to be spared said crewe gravely i think we may leave it to brett to brett exclaimed marsland springing to his feet again in renewed excitement do you think he has escaped death do you think he has got away i feel sure he was killed but if his body is recovered the police will learn from it that it was you who shot lumsden how will they find that out the girl maynard has told them that he had an important paper in his possession when he was drowned and that is why they are so anxious to recover the body they do not know the contents of the document but it is an easy matter to divine them let us look at this matter 
in the way in which brett must have looked at it after thinking it over carefully he knew that you had shot lumsden he knew that if he met you his life would not be worth a moment's purchase the shot you fired at him when he was breaking into your room at staveley was an emphatic warning on that point if he needed any warning do you think that he would not take steps to bring his death and lumsden's death home to you in the event of his being shot down if he had got out of the country as no doubt he had hoped to do he would have put the police on your track for shooting lumsden if the police recover brett's body they will find on it a document setting forth brett's account of how lumsden met his death no doubt his and lumsden's treachery will be glossed over but your share in the tragedy will be plainly put i overlooked all this said marsland quietly let us walk across to the cliffs and see what they are doing they left the farm and walked slowly towards the cliffs each immersed in his own thoughts there were a few groups of people on the road and another group at the top of the hill suddenly there arose a shout and the people on the road started running towards the cliffs they found it the cry of the people on the beach below was carried up to the cliffs and crew and marsland looking down saw the fishermen in one of the boats close to the cliff lift from the water the dripping stiffened figure of a man which had been brought to the surface by the grappling irons end of chapter twenty six end of the mystery of the downs by john watson and arthur j reese